Hello, everyone. Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 673rd New Social Environment. I'm Chloe Stagaman, Director of Programs here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Errol McDonald and Fong H. Bowie. We're thrilled to welcome poet Patricia Spears Jones here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. Here in New York, we're on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgements are not a replacement for actual necessary decolonial work, but a reminder of place of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustained and enriched the stolen land we are speaking from. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's guest and host. Publisher Errol McDonald is the vice president and executive editor in the Knopf Doubleday division of Penguin Random House, where he has worked in various editorial capacities for more than three decades. Among the distinguished authors he has published are James Baldwin, Henry Louis Gates Jr., Kazuo Ishiguro, Fran Leibowitz, Toni Morrison, and many others. Of Caribbean heritage, McDonald was born in Limon, Costa Rica. He's been a lecturer in Yale College and an adjunct professor at Columbia. McDonald joined the PEN America board in 2012 and is on the board at the Brooklyn Rail. Artist, writer, and independent curator Fong H. Bowie is publisher and artistic director of the Brooklyn Rail, the River Rail, Rail Editions, and Rail Curatorial Projects. Among many other awards, Bowie received the Dorothea and Leo Rabkin Prize for Arts Writers in 2017, was the recipient of an honorary doctorate from the University of the Arts in 2020, and the American Academy of Arts and Letters Award for Distinguished Service to the Arts in 2021. And with that, it's my pleasure to pass it over to you, Fong. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction, Chloe. Um, thank you for joining us, Errol. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's been a long time. I've been wanting to do this forever, but I should start saying that, you know, I, I have known you, heard of you as a legend in the publishing world for sure for a long time, but I didn't really get to, to know you well or came to know you more intimately by ways of this remarkable book. So it is Robert Bergman, A Kind of Rapture. So that was published, I think, in 1998. And I met Robert Bergman maybe 10 years prior to that through the esteemed art historian, Mai Shapiro, and his wife, Dr. Lillian Milgram. Uh, and we've been friends forever. But having gone back recently and reread Maya's incredible, for, uh, I think, afterward, and The Fisher Woman, as an introduction essay by Toni Morrison uh, have made me almost cry twice. And I know that I heard her reading of it also in 2007 uh, on the occasion of Berkman's incredible moving show of the smaller version of the portrait. I did the bigger version portrait at MoMA PS1 why Sarah Greeno, the curator there at the National Gallery of Art did a smaller version of it, the original format, where Tony came and read in person, and it was amazing. So that's how we met, you know, and in a way, my first question is, before we go into greater depth about everything else about you, um, is that the book, I know it was profoundly influenced by Robert Frank, 1955, The Americans. And now consider um, as a, a classic. I mean, many critics we know, David Levi Strauss, Lyle Rexer, Charles Strauss, among others, they all thought it's one of the greatest books ever published on a photographer. So I just wanted to ask you how the book came into being, how you met Bergman and then managed to you know, publish this book. How I met Bergman is um, a question impossible to answer given the vicissitudes of my memory. Um, what I do remember is our engagement with him over the course of the book's production. And yeah. that um, he was a man who 
was determined to confer aesthetic dignity on human beings who are usually re regarded as the detritus of the society. That was what mm. appealed to me tremendously about the project. Now, the irony here is that he would never publish this book because he's a man of iron will without the involvement of Meyer Shapiro and Toni Morrison, because he felt mm. that those were the two cultural figures who were equipped to um, contextualize properly the book's existence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And was it an enduring difficult process to produce such a book because the exquisiteness of the reproduction I had the good sense to um, pawn him off to our um, our director of um, production because mm -hmm. the technical necessities for the production of this book were um, outrageously precise and demanding. Yeah. And um, since photography is not my field, I simply withdrew from the process and said yay or nay to what I said. Well, that's amazing haiku response, Errol. <laughs> I don't know what else to follow that, but you know, I listen you know, to many of our conversation, of course, several one we had together uh, with our mutual friend, Alfred and Barbara McAdam, who through their introduction, reintroduction, we finally have many dinners together. But I noticed your frequent use of word peculiar. Um, and I want to ask, can you share the genesis of, of, of how and when it became one of your mo most favorite or distinctive word, peculiar? Yes, when I, um, I came to America in 1964 and soon thereafter, um, Marvin Gaye had a song called Ain't That Peculiar. Oh. And um, that was the first time I'd heard the word. So because I was a pretty nerdish child, I looked it up. And it seemed to me to um, account for so much about life. Ain't that peculiar? Um, a peculiarity. And um, it stuck with me. Wow. That long? And what age was this, Errol? I was probably probably around um, 11 or 12. And at the time, there were um, black Muslim children who um, I went to school with and who spoke in an unusual way. Um, they would never say, for instance, do you want to play basketball? They'd say, would you care to indulge in a game of basketball? So the formality of um, words was something that um, has always stayed with me. Remarkable. Um, so before we, we get a chance to talk to you and ask you about your relationship um, with Toni Morrison, I know that she was important to you as a mentor, as a friend, uh, a relationship that sustained for the longest time. Um, but I like to share something that, that she said that stuck with me too. You know, it's interesting, a certain thing we listen to, or we read, and it stay in our memory arrow. And I think this is one of the instant, just like your Marvin Gaye peculiar. And it peculiar for me was listen to uh, her Nobel Prize acceptance speech. That was 1993, where at one point she say, one upon a time, the first sentence of our childhood that we all remember the phrase, once upon the time. And I always love that phrase, once upon the time. It just means that we have a certain entitlement to have a beginning of our journeys. You know, we start out somewhere. So I know you were born in a sleepy Caribbean port to a city. <laughs> and, and, and what was, how would you describe your upbringing there? Um, and, and how, were your parents at all supported parents? And, and, and what prompted your father and your mother deciding to bring the family to Brooklyn, New York, when you were barely four years old? Well, that assumes that um, I had a father and mother. Um, my father is someone um, I think I may have met 
two or three times in the first 10 years of my life and mm -hmm. only two or three times. So he was not part of um, the scene, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. I grew up essentially in a matriarchy. My grandmother, maternal grandmother ruled and um, my aunts and their daughters also lived with us, us meaning my mother and me. Um, in fact, during those years, um, at home, I was simply called boy since there was no other evidence of masculinity in the place. Mm -hmm. So my grandmother, my mother, um, my cousins, my aunts, they all called me boy. So I grew up very supported by that matriarchy mm -hmm. and um, was empowered with um, a strong sense of self. Did you and I attended um, both Spanish and English schools just about every day. Mm -hmm. um, but the English that I was studying um, had very little to do with the English that I was speaking at home. Because the English that I was speaking at home was essentially um, Caribbean Patois. Uh-huh. Okay. How, and how did you manage to do... Um, um, you, I, you went to the Bronze... Yeah, my mother, my mother came um, to America, you know, because in those days it was assumed the streets were paved with gold. And she uh, worked as a seamstress in the garment district and then sent for me um, when I was 10, um, mm. having lived with an aunt, a sister of hers, um, sent for me when I was 10 and I came to live with her in, um, in bed size, essentially. Mm -hmm. Wow. So did you, um, you did well in high school? I did well in high school. Um, I was, um, if only because I was very, very driven um, about the sciences. Mm -hmm. So my specialities were essentially math and physics. Um, and um, on the strength of my um, record, I was able to get a full scholarship to go to Yale. Mm -hmm. and that's where I met um, two among the audience today, Alfred and Bobby McCann. As an under undergrad? As an undergraduate, they were um, a young happening couple at my college. Well, here you are, a terrific. Um, nice. That scares one. even me. <laughs> nice afro there, for sure, with the legend. Ah, the, ah, what I would do for some of that. I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't mind being that, even looking at myself right now, Errol. Well, you know, a soupçon of that might be um, appreciated. Okay. <laughs> So you, you, this is when you got to jail, jail, I mean, I don't mean jail, I mean Yale, 1971, where you were a student, both undergrad and grad. Um, right. So in one of the um, New York Times ma magazine, an interview, it actually in the Times, and, and you say decisively that, that you were not interested in, uh, the Radian deconstruction. In other words, French structuralism was not your cup of tea <laughs> and that you came to New York. And I, this is interesting, Errol, because you came to New York and got an entry level position at Random House. Right. Uh, where you completely surrendered to the world of publishing. Uh, can you share us uh, this trajectory in so far how it pass it somewhere between self-determinism without fear and mm -hmm. complete surprise it brings as the result. So here you are with Tony Morrison. Well, there were, you know, I got the job at Random House um, through um, Tony um, mm -hmm. and um, a mutual friend of ours, um, Henry Louis Gates had suggested that um, you know, she and I should talk and she facilitated a job for me there. Um, now I had intended just to stay there for the summer. Mm -hmm. you know? And then um, 
return to Yale, not to the graduate school, but to law school so that, you know, yeah. I can make some money in life. However, yeah. um, I started out working for um, one of the legendary figures in the history of American publishing, a man named Jason Epstein, who of essentially course. invented the trade paperback, was the imagineer of the New York Review of Books, um, was um, the driving force behind the invention of um, the Library of America, in addition to being a, um, a non-pareil editor and publisher. And he said something to me very early on. He said, if you, if you stay in this industry, um, you can be a graduate student forever. Yeah. Okay. Um, you can learn things, immerse yourself in subject matters that you never imagined mm -hmm. you'd be interested in and um, develop a store of knowledge that few other jobs would afford you. Yeah. That had tremendous um, that had tremendous impact on me. Yeah. And um, his subtext was also that someone with my background was a rarity in publishing, and that um, I could make uh, what he imagined would be a single contribution to the cultural landscape. Yeah. So he was your mentor, you can he was, say. He, he and Tony jointly were my mentors in those early days. Amazing. She, he worked at Random House at the time as an editor. Yeah. So she was um, a North Star, so to speak, for the likes of me who were trying to break into the industry. Yeah. Not bad as a two mentor you have from early on, I must mm -hmm. admit. <laughs> but let me, so this photo is taken just so that our uh, audience will know. Jill Clemens um, is an author herself, children's book writer, and uh, the widow of Kurt Vonnegut, um, who take many wonderful photographs. So thank you, Jill, in case you ever see this uh, conversation here. So look, looking back now, and we're talking, and, and we'll get back to Tony again, because um, I love to, to, to ask a few more questions. As we're talking now, uh, Errol, you've been at Random House for now 45 years. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a huge milestone compared to my 22 years at the rail, at the Book and Rail. How, how would you describe that total experience of having done every possible required task, you know, in the business. Does that bring both pain and pleasure together? Because <laughs> I, I mean, I know what it's like to, to do everything from the beginning, from the scratch, all the way to well, work today. Put it this way, for 45 years, I've been awash in difficult pleasures. Mm -hmm. Okay, which is to say that, um, There is much homogeneity, um, mm -hmm. cultural, racial, social, economic, among people who apply the publishing trade. Yeah. Okay? And to always go in day in and day out and be the other um, has been a fascination um, for me. Some days, um, I was on the verge of quitting. Um, mm -hmm. And then the very next day I was more committed than ever to what I do. Yeah. Uh, and, and so when, when you were named um, to be the executive the editor, that was 1990 uh, of Pantheon. Right. It was in the wake of Andre Shifflin. Long time publisher departure. We actually interviewed Andre in 2007, I believe, the Mott issue. Right. Uh, so he described his, his own trajectory too for having, you know, published, helped to publish author the now his household name with the Foucault, Chomsky, and brought their work to the larger commercial audience. And then, of course, it was that same year that he launched the new press. Uh, could you share more about that very interesting so-called passing on the baton? Not so sure with the... Well, the, the you know, it, it wasn't so much a passing, passing of, of any baton. 
Batan because um, Andre was a man of huge achievement. Um, to compare myself to him would be ludicrous. Um, compare myself at that time to him would be ludicrous. Right. So, you know, I all props to Andre Schifrin, but his stance vis-a-vis -vis publishing troubled me, yeah. which was that um, he did not feel the imperative of having to be self-sustaining as a publisher. Got it. And I firmly believe that um, in order to be in business, you got to be in business. Yeah. And you have to be able to support your um, your business as a going concern. Yeah. So if there was any disagreement in our philosophies, that would have been it. Yeah. Well, that's something that I need. I need to learn more because. There's never been a thinking about business prospect in the broken rail from the get go. It was meant to stay free, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but it's interesting, Errol. I learned when I met Maya Shapiro, older brother, uh, at a birthday of his, Morris H. Shapiro, his name was. Um, he was an investment banker, first a chess champion, went to Columbia, became a civil engineer, and then ended up using his chess expertise and became an amazing American investment banker. Mm -hmm. So in the 50s, he negotiated. This is interesting because I'm learning about how two, three, four, or even more can merge together in, in, in so far that you're talking about business here. Mm -hmm. he, he negotiated the merger of Chase Bank and Bank of Manhattan and Chemical mm -hmm. Bank and New York Trust Company, uh, and it's outstanding. I still don't understand it, Chase Manhattan Bank and all the things. So the merging between Random House and Pantheon, and now, you know, it's hard to even, how to put it, Canop, Double Day, Penguin, Random House. I, when I read your bio, I still don't understand how did that come together. So can you share a little bit of that? Uh, to our audience to, to, so we understand what happened. Okay, well, um, when I started in publishing, Random House was owned by um, another defunct company, RCA. Mm -hmm. okay. Random House was simply one of an investment in RCA's vast portfolio, which also included um, a chicken processing plant. Yeah. Okay. Um, RCA um, really didn't understand the publishing business and decided to divest itself of it by um, selling the company to um, Cy Newhouse of Advanced Publications. Okay. Yeah. Cy, for the longest time, was um, a brilliant patron, because that is the proper word here, patron mm -hmm. of Random House Inc. And then he too decided enough was enough. So he yeah. sold the company to um, Bertelsmann. Okay. Uh -huh. um, Bertelsmann initially um, owned only Random House Inc., which was comprised of a multiplicity of imprints, including Random House, Knopf, Pantheon, Crown, um, Valentine, yeah. et cetera. Um, Later in its ownership of Random House Inc., it sought a merger um, with Penguin. And um, we have been um, appreciating the, um, the difficult pleasures of the merger ever since. Yeah, okay. Well, that's clear up a little bit there, which is, I understand a little bit more, by the way, in case some of you don't know, Sainuhau's father, Sainuhau Senior, was a publisher of North Star Ledger, uh, the very popular ones newspaper in Newark, where Sainuhau was born, not far from his friend from childhood. I don't know how long the friendship sustained, namely the New York Times cultural critic, the late Dory Aston. Very interesting. But um, so, yeah. Can we, well, here you are, 
let, let's just, maybe we can take this opportunity uh, right here, Errol. Here you are with um, Wole Soyinka at the Nobel, Nobel Prize ceremony. This is 86 due to his first book. So maybe we can go to the book if there are any, un unless there are more photo here, Koei. Here you are with Frank Libowitz. This is later. Here we are. This is the book. Okay. That won't um, when I published AK as a junior editor, it received arguably the best review, um, most rapturous review I um, had ever read up to then and probably since. Um, mm -hmm. And so, Shoyinka had always been um, recognized as a major figure yeah. in literature as a playwright, poet, and novelist, and essayist, but mostly throughout the British Commonwealth. Yeah. Here he was finally receiving the recognition he so clearly deserved um, in the United States. Yeah. The book um, actually sold a few copies. And um, several years later, Shainka won the Nobel Prize in Literature, the first um, Black person to win the Nobel Prize in Literature. Yeah. Um, one should note that um, seven years later, um, Toni Morrison won. And I think the year before that, um, Derek Walcott won. So um, fully three fourths of all the Black people who won the Nobel Prize were concentrated in that brief period. Okay. Interesting. Um, and yeah, when he was named um, a Nobel laureate, he invited um, a bunch of us um, to go to Stockholm and celebrate. And yeah. it was one of the great experiences of my life because um, especially in those days, the early 80s, yeah. um, in the wake of the civil, in the wake of the, the, the slowing down of the civil rights movement, this was a grand affirmation, yeah. or so it felt, of um, cultural pride. So the first of many of your being present there, um, of all those wonderful writers who won the Nobel Prize, can we see the? Well, the thing about the Nobel Prize is that when an author of yours wins it, you don't expect the, you don't expect it to happen twice. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's like I... lightning striking. <laughs> okay. This in in the belly of the beast, um, letters from prison, yeah. by Jack Henry Abbott was um, a terrifying experience because um, it suggested that the word writing could be a matter of life and death. Yeah. Okay. Um, Jack Henry Abbott was a man who um, started writing to Norman Mailer when Mailer was writing the Executioner's song. He told Mailer that he knew nothing about prison and yeah. that if he wanted to be educated, um, Jack would be willing to write him letters. Um, they had a correspondence and several of the letters were published in the New York Review of Books and um, bold, me and my boss at the time, Jason Epstein over, and um, we signed up the book. One of the most har harrowing experiences of my life was to go meet Jack, who was in prison for life, um, having murdered people. Um, one of the most terrifying experiences is going to Marion, Illinois, to the maximum security prison in Marion, Illinois, to um, meet my author for the first time. It did not go as well as it could have, the meeting. Yeah. Um, if only because Jack's image of um, a New York publisher was decidedly not me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow. Okay, and um, so the book was published, when, when the book was published, it was featured on the front page of the New York Review, of the New York Times book review. But what I didn't know that Sunday was that Jack had killed someone um, a night or two before. Yeah. Okay, and then subsequently went on the lam and was captured and sent back to prison where um, he eventually killed himself. 
Yeah. And it's a book that um, taught me um, the responsibility of my vocation. Um, that yeah. compelled me to appreciate that this is serious business. Yeah. Wow. Such bravery to have published that book in, in that context. So 1981 was a big year for you, Errol. This mm -hmm. was published in 81, and so it was Arcade Years of Childhood. So can we see the next book which we talked uh, before? Um, Robert Ferris Thompson. You, who yeah, Robert you? Ferris Thompson is um, a legendary professor of um, history of art at Yale. He passed away last December. And mm -hmm. I would also describe him as a mentor because he brought a certain kind of um, robust um, attentiveness to um, disciplines that had um, Theretofore um, shafted, so to speak. Um, he was the dean of African and American, the dean of the study of African and Afro American art and philosophy. And this was actually the very first book that I ever um, contracted for. Um, oh, what amazing. is interesting about it is that um, 40 years later, it still remains in print and is considered a classic in the field. In fact, next Sunday, I'm going to um, a celebration of his life and achievement. Um, um, and we'll say a few words at the event. Wonderful. It's a wonderful book and to have in your library, that's for sure. Um, thank you, Errol. Can we move to the next one, Chloe? Um, the House on Mango Street was um, issued by a small Texas publisher called Arte Publico. And we bought rights to that book, if only because um, there was a, it was clear at the time that there was a hunger for books by um, constituencies that had not been properly served by the publishing establishment. There was evidence that books such as these were beginning to make incursions into the, um, the programs of study in high school and college um, throughout yes. the country. And so we bought rights to the House on Mango Street and it went on to um, sell year in and year out more than 100,000 copies a year. Amazing. So between 81, 82, 83, it seems like a momentum of your literary... Well, the thing about, the thing about these, these dates is that um, The House on Mango Street may have been published in 1983, but my edition was published um, later. Yeah. Okay. We bought rights later than 1983. Can we move to the next one, which is the, yeah. Tell us more about this book, Errol. Sure. Um, the first two books that Salman published after the fatwa yeah. um, were a collection of stories called East West, which I published, and his first novel after the Satanic Verses was The Moor's Last Sigh, yeah. um, which we published, I believe, in 1995. Um, it, was a, it was a bestseller. Mm -hmm. um, and it reintroduced Salman to um, the culture industry, as it were, as an essential writer of world importance. Um, When he came out, when he was publicizing the book, it, was, it turned out to be arguably the most expensive author tour in the history of mankind and will remain so. And this was done largely um, at the largesse, as it were, of Cy Newhouse, who 
um, knowing of the importance of publishing a writer who had been banned, um, decided to foot the bill to have him travel the country and meet readers and writers. Wow, amazing. Well, I, we sent our speedy recovery for Salman, what, what have happened to him recently. Um, so finger crossed that he'll, he'll bounce back swiftly. Um, can we uh, see the next one, Chloe? This is the book. That okay, we had, um, we, we had an interesting conversation before the beginning of um, this Zoomcast. Yeah. which was what to do about the word, um, how to respect the sensitivity um, of, um, of guests. Um, and I should, I should add that this was, um, this was an issue um, during the publication of the book. Yeah. Because how can you publish a book and not be able to um, state its title? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we published a 20th anniversary edition of the book at um, the commencement of 2022, um, where the issue arose and within the, within the company, um, the word could not appear in the subject line of um, emails, um, it was simply, the euphemism was simply the troublesome word. Yeah. Um, so I will opt for that euphemism today so as not to um, insult anyone or um, um, violate the sensitivity of anybody. Um, but how did it come about um, with Randy? I mean, was it- Okay, well, what happened was that um, years before, um, I'd come, Randy had never written a book. Um, and once upon a time, believe it or not, um, black people who went to Ivy League schools knew of each other, um, period. You knew who went to Harvard, you knew who went to Princeton. I knew, Yan, I knew Randy as, um, as a gross overachiever, um, as um, someone who had done his undergraduate years at Princeton, went off to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, um, returned to um, America and studied law at Yale, mm -hmm. then went off to teach at Harvard Law School and mm -hmm. was writing at the time, and, and this was the early 90s, some pretty provocative um, essays in places like the Wall Street Journal and um, the New Republic. Um, Randy wrote a piece on race, crime, and the law that I found intriguing and powerful, and so I commissioned him to do a book. Yeah. Um, he subsequently um, wrote a work called Interracial Intimacies, um, which was about intermarriage, divorce, um, adoption, et cetera, et cetera. But he also dropped this short book on my desk one day, and I thought he was out of his mind. Yeah. Um, but when I read the book, Needless to say, it was um, precisely what it needed to do, mm -hmm. what it needed to be, which is um, a, an anatomy of a word um, in all of its um, pernicious significations. Um, it was an, an anatomy of the word, a history of the word, and a sociology of the word. Yeah. Um, it, and so I, I felt that, um, you know, this was, this had all the makings of an essential publication that would um, enrage a lot of people and yeah. spark um, meaningful controversy. And sure enough, um, the book and its title appeared on the New York Times bestseller list. Yeah, amazing. Um, the the subtitle um, was, by the way, um, ripped off by me from um, C. Van Woodward's The Strange Career of Jim Crow. Got it. That makes sense. 
And so from this book to Cobra number two. Uh, yeah, this, I, I put that on the list just to suggest the range of interests um, yeah. and that, you know, um, so-called literature is a very small part of the publishing universe. And, you know, a book such as Cobra II, the inside story of the invasion occupation of Iraq, which has since come to be regarded as the definitive book of its kind, um, can subsidize the publication in part of um, books that don't reach as wide an audience. And right. this was um, a strong bestseller, strong New York Times and national bestseller for us. And Bernard, Bernard Trainer, being the a retired Marine Corps Lieutenant General. Yes, he um, died in the last two years, but he was essential to the book's um, creation because he knew everybody um, in the military and provided Michael Gordon, who at the time was the chief military correspondent of the New York Times with mm -hmm. unparalleled access. Yeah. Well, it was a, certainly a tragedy, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that Dan Simon, the publisher of Seven Story Press, just around the same time published September 11, Noam mm -hmm. Chomsky's book mm -hmm. that really became a, a very popular book for them. Uh, the subject was controversial as we all know it. And I remember the bombing at Baghdad um, when essentially make CNN so accessible and became a household TV 24 hours a day uh, network and so horrified to see the bombing of Baghdad from a vantage point a fix so far from a distance. No, you know, no close up was revealed. We see no violence. It was essentially a unified image or sequence of image of almost like uh, William Turner burning of the parliament the house of burning, you know, the house burning the parliament and the 4th of July. It's, it's opposite of what imagery or reportage has revealed during the, the war in Vietnam. So it was a very, very strange time era. I'm glad that you published this book. Um, can we move along the next one? Yeah, this is uh, another important book. Can you tell us a little bit more about this? Sure. Um, Skip Gates and I have been friends for, um, at this point, around 50 years, half a century. Um, I had published um, other works by him, but this was um, the first book of its kind, which was a major illustrated book um, with text tracing the history of Black people in America up to Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, Life Upon These Shores is um, the, it's either the title or um, a line in a Robert Hayden poem um, when we were digging around for a title, I came up on life upon these shores and it seemed um, so apt mm -hmm. um, as a description, as a, as a, as a non-polemical description of um, the experience of Blacks upon these shores. Mm -hmm. Did this book do well, Errol? Yes, it did, it did fairly well as um, an expensive, oversized, illustrated book um, that um, used as a model um, several of Ken Burns' books, um, for instance, on the Civil War or baseball. It yep. was done um, in that format. Terrific. Wow. And now we're going to leap to the northern one, which is far different from what we've been talking about yeah. all together. Who we are and how we got here, ancient DNA and the new science of the human past. 
um, by, um, uh, you can only be described as a genius, um, a, a profound philosopher of various disciplines at Harvard, David Wright, who's relatively young. Um, I've always had an interest in um, science yeah. um, since my days at the Bronx High School of Science. Um, and I sort of um, strayed from um, a strict interest in it um, as a result of something that my um, freshman roommate, Vince de Blasi, once said to um, a mutual friend of ours who was a brilliant mathematician. He said to John, you know, you guys in the sciences, all you have to do is be right, okay? Uh-huh. All you have to do is be right. We, however, in the humanities have to interpret. <laughs> and, um, that always stuck with me as a, as a, as a, as a defensive put down by humanists yeah. of the rigors of science. Um, yeah. And this is a book that meant a lot to me if only because um, it proves conclusively um, the impossibility of um, population purity. Yeah. And um, through the study of ancient DNA, ancient meaning you know, tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of years ago, um, yeah. We can, no population can insist upon um, self-defined integrity. Yeah. That to a certain degree, we're all of us mixed in ways that we're not even aware of. Yeah. So the book is good for democracy, Arrow. Excuse me? Is the book good for democracy? <laughs> it is the scientific basis of democracy. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's, let's uh, maybe end with this book. I'm sure you probably have taken class with Harold. Yes. Um, you know, I've known Harold since, uh, I knew Harold since um, I was a graduate student um, between 75 and 1975 and 1977. And um, we always remained. Um, close. Um, and toward the end of his life, I published um, several books by him. And so we came full circle. Um, the, the teacher, um, I, used to te- I, I used to tease him that the teacher-student relationship um, had decidedly changed. I was now in charge. Yeah. That gave him, um, that gave him an occasion to laugh. Yeah. yeah, it's a moving book. Uh, it's it's uh, something that I would encourage every undergrad student in literature should read. Um, um, what I would, the way I would describe it is that Harold um, wrote about the same subjects throughout his life. Um, yeah. And so, some of his work can feel repetitive. Yeah. This book is, can be regarded as um, his autumnal summa. Yeah. Um, and should be read as such. It is a powerful work that takes you through his concerns, mm-hmm. um, his mm-hmm. literary interests um, from the Greeks to now. Yeah. Um, we also, you know, we also put together um, posthumously a, a book called The Art of Fiction. Now, Harold was not known as, um, pr- not known primarily for his um, criticism of novels. Right. And um, The Art of Fiction brings precisely that. Every, most of everything he wrote um, about the novel from of course, the Quixote to Josh Cohen today. Yeah. Um, one thing I know by my own experiment, Errol, when I was teaching 
graduate seminar in writing and criticism, uh, the class is required to recite a poem by memory. So mm -hmm. had the student was asked to memorize any poem from a flap laptop, a computer, or the iPhone, and the other half will be reading and memorizing from a real book. And it turned out that the latter, the one that commit to memory from the book are the one remember them all. Mm -hmm. The one who tried to memorize from the laptop and iPhone did not. Uh, so it's, it's, that's why I felt every reading should be always be read from a physical book or at least a piece of paper. Well, to this day, to this day, um, I have yet to read a book um, electronically. Um, if only because the book itself is a superior technology to so-called um, Kindles and the like. I mean, those are mere storage devices that yeah. um, offer you um, newfangled options to supposedly enhance the reading experience. Um, I myself am a bookman, will remain a bookman until I die, and um, I don't know what else to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, the, well, la last time we also mentioned, actually, when we have dinner with um, Barbara and Alfred at their lovely home, Clara was there, and Amanda, my friend, was there also. We mentioned a little bit of our reading, or at least read reading, I think I might have read that book twice, Anti-Intellectualism in American Life, mm -hmm. Richard Hofstadter. And that was, I think, 63, and it won 1964 Pulitzer Prize for general nonfiction. And in thinking about it, Errol, in regarding to our social political time, what we are trying to get through, doesn't that generate or at least evoke a reminder of how the perpetual divisiveness or the kind of, I would say, you know, bipolarity of religious right, religious observation, which was very much anticipated as way back, and you would think about actually another Yale professor um, before the Great Awakening, long ago. Um, and then there are people who aspire towards a certain path to a, for reason and rationalization, and people who are committed to this kind of thinking, intellectual life, as we are belonging to at the moment, you and I, and some of our friends here. So the friction is very intense. Mm -hmm. And what we witnessed recently during the Trump years brought that out more pronouncedly. So how do, how do you feel about that, that book now? Does it have any strong resonance? Well, the, that book, Anti-Intellectualism and um, the Paranoid Style in American History, um, are books that um, are compelling, if only because they suggest, no, they do more than suggest, they prove that um, much that we regard as unique to our times um, is actually intrinsic to American history. You know, people forget that there was, there was once a political party that proudly called itself the Know Nothings. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, they didn't have fancy names like QAnon or um, Republican. They got down to basics. We are the Know Nothings. Okay. Would you like to join us? Yeah. And so those two books provide a prism um, through which best to appreciate political and social goings on today, at least by my, um, by my lights. Yeah. Okay, and, and how does that, um, 
in a way corresponding to you know the classes you teach now Errol, particularly Faulkner alongside with Tony Morrison share well, some you know what I decided to teach a course on Faulkner um, after I read um, a quote from Salman Rushdie, wherein he said that William Faulkner was the writer of greatest relevance to contemporary writers in Africa, Asia, etc. Mm-hmm. In among writers of the so-called global south. Right. And I decided to teach a a class called William Faulkner and World Literature. Um, um, And so we read um, five books by Faulkner, Sun Fury as I Lay Dying, Sanctuary, um, Light in August, and Absalom, Absalom, um, that is the first module of the course. And then the second module is comprised of um, authors from um, throughout the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and where does Tony um, works fit into the, the course? She is, she is one of those writers. We read Beloved. Yeah. I the see. second module. Because yeah. Tony had a complicated relationship with um, with Faulkner. Um, there are people who um, refuse to accept the fact that Toni Morrison is best appreciated as a high modernist writer. Right. Okay? And that in fact, um, you know, she wrote her dissertation, not dissertation, her master's thesis at Cornell on mm-hmm. suicide in Virginia Woolf and Faulkner. Okay. So she was keenly aware of, narr- of modernist narrative strategies and procedures. Yeah. Um, and those narrative strategies and procedures, um, some of them um, came to her through Faulkner. Yeah. And through her appreciation of Latin American narrative. Okay. So she is a necessity in the course. Yeah. And if you were to say no more than four or five paragraphs of what you learned from Tony Errol, please share with us. Okay. Four or five paragraphs, that's a lot of paragraphs. <laughs> <laughs> I remember some lines. Um, once in my career, she said, um, you know, I know you're wrong about that, but never back down. Never back down. Mm Because this juggernaut will eat you up. Wow. She also, um, she was not a woman who um, was shy about self-appreciation. She once told me that, um, she once said to me, having read two sentences, to me, um, boy, I'm good, okay? Boy, I'm good, okay? Uh-huh. <laughs> and it is that belief in oneself yeah. um, that inspired me. Mm-hmm. She never had any, um, any qualms about appreciating herself. Mm-hmm. And, that steeliness was um, what allowed her to dismiss some of the patently racist and misogynist reviews that she received early in her career. Yeah. How would you describe also Tony's relationship with Fran Libowitz? It's very unlikely a friendship, but those who know them. Well, it was a, it was a profound friendship um, that started out when some organization decided to put them on the road together mm-hmm. as on an author tour. And they became fast friends and were friends for as long as I've known both. One of the things that people don't realize about Tony 
is that she had a vicious sense of humor. Mm -hmm. And in that she had something in common with Fran. Um, the one thing that um, is very, very different about them was that Tony was um, an unreconstructed watcher of daytime TV. She loved her daytime TV. Um, Fran has not owned the TV in decades. That's right. So it is interesting to appreciate how um, two human beings who in certain respects are radically different um, can have so much in common. In fact, that um, the memorial for Tony, Fran had a beautiful line, a hysterically funny line, which was that um, Tony was two or three of her four best friends. And that was it? No, she had a lot more to say. <laughs> okay. <laughs> how did how did Tony manage to survive the endless, you know, God, smoking cigarette? It was a chain smoker friend. Uh, well, I mean, Tony was not. Um, Tony smoked once upon a time. Okay. So I guess it was a matter of, um, you know, a standoff between Fran's cigarettes. Right. And Tony's shots of vodka. Oh, I see. Because you know how she is about her books, friend. Right. Our first edition, Precious Being, right. they are in glass case. Well, she's a she's a she's a stone cold collector, book collector. Um, yeah. And I once asked him why they have to be protected with beautiful glass in front. And <laughs> say, see, she doesn't want a nicotine to. Put put a patina on the on the book right. on the books. Right. Uh, it's so funny. Well, this is terrific, Errol. I love to talk more. Obviously, we have you know other figures that we admire. We can talk forever, but I think we're gonna kind of want to share, open up to the Q and A because I'm sure other friends and audience people here probably would like to ask their questions. So thank you and. And we continue all the time, and, and I give it back the mic to you, Chloe. Thank you so much, Fong, and thank you, Errol, for that incredible conversation. Um, our first question is from Lynn Crawford in the audience. Lynn, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Thank you. Can you hear me? This was so inspiring and beautiful and rich, and thank you, both of you. Um, I had a little bit of a a question wondering if it wasn't in some way, not nostalgic, but if the model you were discussing about publishing um, was going to exist in the future, in the near future. And I'm curious what you think about the future of publishing. And if you ever see a time when big publishing houses can successfully publish not just poetry, but novels, um, beefy novels that might be successful. Mm. Well, there are publishing companies that have dedicated um, poetry programs. So, mm -hmm. for instance, at Knopf, we have a, a, a pretty fulsome poetry program, a program devoted to the publication of poetry every season. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. As for, you know, as for the, but let's not put too fine a point on it. Um, this is an exercise in philanthropy on the part of um, on the part of publishers, and I don't mean that um, disparagingly, because for the most part, most books are beneficiaries of publishing philanthropy. Um, you know, the, 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 I've always believed that the model, the best model um, for appreciating the publishing industry is the pharmaceutical industry, um, wherein companies um, pump a lot of money into research. Um, most of what they're researching or producing fails, but every now and then they hit on Viagra. 
and that allows <laughs> them to keep going. Similarly with publishers, um, what um, keeps publishers going is the strength of their backlist, books published um, previously that continue to sell handsomely and outrageously well um, year in, year out. So that model will not change. What might change is the willingness on the part of publishers to explore the possibility of losing more money by reaching out to other audiences in the expectation that they will strike gold through diversity. But on the diversity front, um, I'm not particularly hopeful, if only because there was this um, moment of um, um, celebration of self-virtue after the uh, murder of George Floyd, um, which in provoked a commitment from publishers throughout not just America, but the world to change their ways. Um, that is on the wane right now. Thank you so much for that, Errol, and thank you for that question, Lynn. Um, our well, I have a feeling that my answer was a buzzkill. <laughs> no, not at all. I'm, I guess I was asking about the possibility of small publishers, but I... I well, small know. publishers have to sustain themselves right. yeah, I got as, it. Un, as going concerns. So they too, are, um, they too are preoccupied with profitability. They have to be. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you. No, I just want to, Errol, I just want to add in also extending a little bit to what Lynn have asked in that, you know, sometimes we publish things, Lynn, out of necessity. Mm -hmm. uh, what Errol is saying is in a broader, bigger realm, much bigger context. But, you know, when you think back further on, way, for example, who got press because Tony written on Virginia Woolf just reminded me of who got press that was started by Leonard Woolf. Mm -hmm. uh, that was out of nothing. He had a little printing press and he decided to do it in 1917. And that was a carrier of all the publishing to the lighthouse and all the beautiful essay, small essay, uh, by, you know, people like Lyndon Strachey and even, you know, the great art historian critic, Edward, um, Roger Fry. So it's a very small book and they did it for a long time. I mean, same thing with, uh, let's say, Seven Arts. Seven mm -hmm. Arts was only survived one year, 1916 to 17. In college, I bought it the whole entire 10 issue out of your sale. And it stayed with me forever. I mean, that was tiny, but it was the first magazine that were brought together all the seven arts, you know, and was published in the West Village, but it had a tremendous ripple effect uh, on how the formation of the rail, cross-pollination of different disciplines get inspired by it, you know, only three people who ran that space. So yeah, I mean, the smaller, you know, press doesn't share the greater concern as Arrow with Random House and Penguin, and it's a bigger picture there. But um, I'm just saying that out of, uh, you know, when you inspire, being inspired, you do strange things, you do un impractical things. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much for that question, Lynn. Um, our next question is going to be from Andrew Woolbright in the audience. Andrew, I'm going to unmute you. I think he's still unmute. Okay. I will ask Andrew's question on Andrew's behalf. Uh, who are current authors or things off the reading list that present new peculiarities to you, Errol? Um, say that again. Yes. Who are current authors 
or books on your reading list who present new peculiarities to you? Um, Pat Patrick Chamazo um, of Martinique um, is someone I published more than 20 years ago, um, Texaco, is the winner of the Prix Goncourt. And he, um, he's an adventuresome thinker and writer um, um, who, is, who is part of um, a group of intellectuals um, of the Caribbean who um, are redefining the cosmopolitanism of the Caribbean. Okay, so Patrick Chamazo, um, Alama Banku from Congo, who has written um, hilarious books, um, whose take on so many subjects that we approach reverentially um, is fresh. Um, he, even did a take on American Psycho called African Psycho. Uh, he was a very funny writer, and um, I would highly recommend um, reading him. Um, and then, you know, I have an enduring fascination with the Austrian writer, um, Thomas Bernhardt, who I feel mm -hmm. is endless to speculation and to imagination. Great writer, Bernhardt. Absolutely. Amazing. Thank you so much for those answers, Errol. And thanks for that question, Andrew. Our next question is going to be from the Rails Managing Editor, Charlie. Good afternoon. Thank you, Fong and Errol, for this incredibly stimulating conversation. I've learned so much. Errol, I was curious about your work as an editor. Um, and my question is a little generic, but you can take it really where you want. And I'm curious, when you approached the different texts, how, how you approached them, given all the variety, and if there was anything that you could share that, that you learned or changed the way you thought about editing as you advanced and became further along in the process. Sure. In, in nearly 45 years, or more than 45 years at this game, um, I understand more so than ever um, that the, edit the editing of a book is the evolution of a personal relationship with an author. Um, it's a very personal um, endeavor, or it should be, um, because both of you are interested in what you're working on to achieve its highest integrity and neither one of you might be aware of what that is at the outset, <laughs> okay? So um, as you learn from each other, um, the editing begins to take shape, okay? Something that I might deem absolutely extraneous to the book is something that an author might deem important. And we find a way to compromise, um, compromise. So I cannot possibly generalize about editing in general. Um, what I can do is simply affirm the, the need for communion between author and you know, um, editor, um, the need for a certain kind of mutual respect. For instance, there are um, authors who call me up and say, you know, I've just written this sentence and I wanted to run it by you. They're writers who refuse to share anything until they have a final draft. So one can't have, you know, um, one cannot edit by fiat, so to speak. Um, I know that it's a useless response on my part, but it is an accurate response. <laughs> thank you so much for that answer, Errol, and thank you for that question, Charlie. Uh, our last question today is from Tom McGlynn, who has asked Eleanor, my colleague, to read the question on his behalf. Yes, thank you so much, Errol and 
Thank you, Fong. And thanks for all these really great questions. Um, so the, on behalf of Tom, I will be asking, uh, what are the current metrics for traditional book readership? By metrics, do you mean, uh, can you elaborate what you mean by metrics? Um, I'm assuming that Tom means um, like, you know, how many people read or purchase books? Um, there've been, there been changes in um, how people uh, engage with books. For instance, for the last 10 years or so, um, the audio market has grown exponentially. Once upon a time, um, the metrics involved simply hardcover sales and paperback sales. Mm -hmm. Now they involve eBooks and um, audiobooks. Yeah. So um, the success of a book involves um, the adding up of all the numbers from all those platforms. Um, there are books that sell, for instance, fewer than 10,000 copies in um, hardcover that go on to sell 50,000 copies in paperback or 14,000 copies in audio and another 12,000 copies as an ebook. Um, so with the publication of every book, publishers wait with antic anticipation um, to see how that will play itself out. Um, mm -hmm. To see whether sales in their totality um, just, justify the investment that they have made. It is possible, for instance, for a book to sell just a few thousand copies and break even, okay? It is possible for a book to sell hundreds of thousands of copies and lose the publisher money. Mm -hmm. If you look at the New York Times bestseller list and you come across the name of an author, you recognize chances are that author might be becoming richer and richer, but the publisher is becoming poorer and poorer. So fascinating. Uh, you know, Errol, um, Robert Graves, who, who once will ask, how do you manage to write so much successful historical novels like I Claudius and whatnot, made into the television series and millions of readers? Mm -hmm. And then you manage to at the same time write your keep up your work as a poet, writing poems. His answer was, it's like I'm 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 read, I'm reading fancy dogs to sell them in order to feed my cat. So I think that apply across the board in, in publishing it, or even in art, in, in, even in the art um, dealing business, so to speak. Because I remember one talking to Leo Castelli, um, how much he had to pay rent, skip stipends, food, the materials, money to Richard Serra, to Bruce Nauman, in the course of the mid seventies to the whole decade of the eighties, none of them were selling anything. Uh, of course, Leo answer was like, well, I can take it from the sale of Rauschenberg, from Jasper John to support the, the not so appreciated yet at the time, <laughs> Nauman and Sarah. So I think it just applied to all of it in what we do. I'm sure that's probably true. Well, I mean, you know, to be sure money is the root of all evil, but money, it can be said, is the root of all art, especially yes. today. Indeed. Thank you so much. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Errol. A practical <laughs> answer there. Back to you, because we are dying to hear Patricia reading. Amazing. Thank you again, Errol and Fong, for such an incredible discussion. It's my pleasure to introduce our Poet Laureate of the Day at the Rail, Patricia Spears-Jones, to the stage. Uh, Arkansas born and raised resident of New York City for more than four decades, Patricia Spears Jones is the recipient of the Jackson Poetry Prize. She was the first African American program coordinator at the Poetry Project, where she later served as mentor for Emerge Surface B, a fellowship program. 
She ran the new works program for the Massachusetts Council of Arts and Humanities and was director of planning and development at the New Museum of Contemporary Art. She's active in organizations involved with progressive politics, social justice, feminism, the environment, and multiculturalism. She curates Word Sunday, a series focused on Brooklyn-based writers and artists, and she's taught at CUNY and Adelphi University. Please join me in welcoming Patricia. Yeah. I've, I'm asking you to unmute there. You should, there you go. Thank you. Hi. Oh, this was exciting. So Earl McDonald, I posted a thing about this and Marilyn Nance said, I went to high school with him. <laughs> <laughs> also went to junior high school with him. <laughs> uh, and, and then Joan Gibbs said, I went to high school with him too. So <laughs> you have some, some people are going, I went to high school with him. Uh, so I think, oh my gosh, it's the New York thing. So I'm going to read um, some poems that just one of which is a very New York poem. And also because the um, Whitney Museum just had an incredible exhibition. Of, uh, they used Steve Cannon's um, mm -hmm. living room basically as uh, one of the installations. And Steve left us a few years ago and I knew him for a long time. So this is walking on Avenue A on the Tompkins Square Park side. And also Sandra Payne is in this particular poem and Sandra's work is now up at the Just Above Midtown ex exhibition, as part of the Just Above Midtown exhibition at uh, Museum of Modern Art. And we will be giving a celebration of her life tomorrow uh, night uh, in downtown Manhattan. Walking on Avenue A on the Tompkins Square side, Park side. We are walking Sandra Payne and me on the open people's Avenue A. It is dark, but too dark and even in the daytime is dark on Avenue A. We walk on the sidewalk on the Tompkins Square Park side, no dogs. We see Steve Cannon driving a sedan. He rolls down his window, wanna ride? Sandra's waves no. But I say, hey, he may be going further. So we go over to where he is parking his car. It's 7th Street. He parallel parks on Avenue A and 7th Street. So the garage man can check his car. This is the unblind Steve, the unglasses Steve. His eyes bright brown, but what is strange is his hair. He has too much straight black hair. It's a wig, a sort of bad beetles cut with bangs. Steve Cannon with bangs. He's smiling, but the hair, it's post chemo wig hair. It's the worst haircut you've ever had and must cover it up wig hair. Steve had that New Orleans mess with me hair. The wig is rebuke of all that New Orleans flair. Steve smiles, patient with the garage man. His ride is a Volvo. It's roomy and safe and he salutes Sandra and me and we salute him back. And then the dream ends. Uh, we all miss Steve um, and it's always great to, you know, that was a visitation. It was very strange because I don't think I ever saw Steve. I'm not even sure if I ever saw Steve in a car. Black Lives Pandemic Protest in parentheses vaccine scribe out. Uh, and this was my protest of the protest. I want a tree house, the Hollywood kind, huge, luxurious, built with a really soft bed and painless windows for ventilation and star observing. In this third floor tenement, fantasy is free. Please send pandemic poems. Please send Black Lives Matters poems. Please stay on topic. Please show your rage, your wisdom. Please stay on that third rail. Step there and implode. Why more poems on stalking death? We want more poems on Black sacrifice. Black sacrifice and stalking death. Let us note the cardinal seasonal migration from South to North, from Virginia to Connecticut, 
that red bird swaggers backyards and park benches, oak trees and the occasional pine, or the electric energy of the many voiced youth chanting, I can't breathe, or defund the police, or expletives deleted, and the president's name, this is the former one, not the one now, okay, and the president's name, the current one, fat snake coiled in or out of his bunker. Oh, builder of that fence surrounding the White House, you now have that gated community paid by we citizens. Oh, thrower of poisonous globs, desirous of adoration, youth, oh, youth, mobile and motivated, moving the energy flow, lightning strikes of faith and dream and right now and no more. Yes, Black Lives Matter, and there they are, living matter, striking the Washington Monument, while little hands and little feet negotiate the bunker's chilly, moldy, moon-faced rooms. But that treehouse for me and my dreamed happy family, the cardinals, robins, starlings, and finches pass to light while their scary cousins, turkey vultures, hawks, and crows, float or flash clouds their warrior wings on brisk display. Another day for the birds and their loud trilling. Another day and the world shakes from marching feet. Another day masks punctuate faces. Virus loops the planet. Strong men erect fences on which people post memoria and cartoons get and cartoons at one corner, someone is pissing. And if I can, I'm one last poem, because it's Halloween season. So this is a Halloween season poem. But this is also about the South, which is where I'm from, but rarely write about. All Hallows Eve, treat winds with respect. And I am so thankful to uh, Fong and all the wonderful Brooklyn Rail people. You guys publish me all the time. Anselm Berrigan, thank you. Monica De La Torre, thank you. See my poems in the Brooklyn Rail. All Hallows Eve, treat winds with respect. They let you hear your mother calling you in from the yard. You see your grandfather ciphering his plan for Brick Lane, his own house on a corner in Memphis that promised prosperity and comfort a fig tree planted for fruit and shade. You hear the slack of cloth across the handsome shoes shine by your Uncle Charlie as he prepares for work. You hear grandmother humming while stirring another cake batter for her beloved chocolate cake switch in the kitchen just in case grandchildren misbehave. You hear your cousin Dolores and Sarah Ann burping and farting a smelly contest, their legs dangling on the side, a brick wraparound. You hear loud laughter vibrating through Memphis humidity. You hear Aunt Jessie chronicling life on McNeil's plantation. You hear her and Aunt Lena gossiping about who's been to Chicago and who didn't go. And you worry that their great arms will shrink and their sisterly rivalry will stop. And then they are on the veil's other side. Well, all the family interred in Arkansas, Tennessee, Mississippi, and some places north of all those hard times and getting by, getting through the day in rot of the South, the day in fight for good times, good people, good Lord, they sang, Granddaddy's voice, a large bell of hope. And mama's voice, the most beautiful of all. The preacher's daughter, the preacher's singer, her lively, lovely face in memory untroubled by time's wrinkles. Vivid her voice as she commands her eldest, that's me, to get inside, get out of the rain. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you so much, Patricia. Thank that was you. amazing. Thank you. Patricia. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, and thank you again, Errol and Fong, for today's conversation. We'd also like to thank the Terra Foundation for sponsoring our NSE program and making daily conversations like this one possible, and for our growing YouTube archive. For the past 22 years, The Rail has provided a platform for arts, culture, and politics through our monthly publication and public events like here on our daily NSE. You can check the chat for a link to donate to support our writers, editors, and operations here at The Rail. And if you're free tomorrow at 1 p.m., join us for a conversation with artist Sarah Sense and hosted by Yasmin Siddiqui on the occasion of Sense's exhibition Power Lines at Bruce Silverstein Gallery. We'll conclude with wow. a reading by Molly McGlennon. And you can now turn on your microphone and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you so much, Patricia. More power to you. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you. 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 Thank